Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Hope International Affiliated Centers webinar series. My name is Rayanne and I am the Assistant Director of Family Justice Center Programs for the Alliance. I'm really excited to host this series that will showcase each of our affiliated centers by giving them an opportunity to share information about their sites and the work they are doing in their community. For more information about becoming an affiliated center or creating a center in your community, please visit our website at allianceforhope.com. I now have the great pleasure of introducing Crystal Sprantz, who will introduce herself and take you on a tour of her center. Crystal? Hi, Rayanne. Uh, my name is Crystal Scrantz. I'm the director of the Family Justice Center of Acadiana. Uh, we are a fairly new center and we operate in Lafayette, Louisiana. So if you look down here to this little star, that's kind of where we're located. We're in South Central Louisiana. So a little bit about us, our parish population is about 240,000. Uh, with this, the city of Lafayette being the largest city within that parish, and it's about 127,000 uh, people in the city. We're the fourth largest city in the state of Louisiana, and we're located in the Acadiana region, hence our name. So the Acadiana region is kind of the heart of Cajun country here in Louisiana, where we work hard, we play hard, we have good music and even better food. Um, so we have a lot of culture here in our area, and we kind of try to bring some of that into our center as well. We, uh, the city of Lafayette started, or I guess the parish rather, Louisiana has parishes versus counties. So uh, the first initiative to open a family justice center started around 2005, just by a group of citizens in our community that were interested in a better response to domestic violence that kind of fizzled out. And then we had a second initiative that began around 2007 that was started with our sheriff's office um, and they were not able to uh, make that happen again. And then we have the third initiative that began with the formation of the Lafayette Domestic Violence Council, which uh, functions as our co coordinated community response team here in Lafayette. And that council formed in 2012. So what happened is we formed that council and we started gathering a lot of data about what was happening here um, in our city and in our parish around domestic violence. What were survivors experiencing? We did listening groups. We did surveys to first responders. We got uh, statistical information from all of the agencies that were involved. And we began to kind of build that data that we needed um, in order to go around and talk to people about what the need was in our community. Um, so with that, I just want to show one of the documents that we made that really made a big impact was this current map of services. So we looked at one 911 call in Lafayette and what that kicked off for a survivor. Um, and each box represented each different step that a survivor would have to take and each color represented a different place that they had to go to to take those steps. And so this really gave a visual and was great for us when we were going around talking about the Justice Center because this is a really overwhelming map and it really got people to thinking about all of the steps that survivors do have to take in order to do just some basic things whenever they're dealing with their domestic violence situation. And then after we um, we finished that, we had a series of really horrific incidents in 2013 that were all over the news regarding domestic violence. And so we really took that opportunity to look at those specific cases and figure out what was happening. And we had uh, kind of a difficult time with that because we really had a lot of finger pointing at that that time in our um, history to where people were saying, well, this is law enforcement or this is the district attorney or this is this person's fault. And so getting people to come in and have an honest conversation about what was actually happening in our community was kind of a challenge. So what we had to do was kind of modify the fatality review process to where we said we were going to talk about only aggregate things as a community. We weren't going to say, 
the DA dropped the ball on this or this agency dropped the ball on this. We were going to say this is what's happening in our community. And so again, one example of what we did was we uh, we did have a, a survivor, Victoria Brandon, who was killed on, on August the 27th. And this is the basic data we just released on each of the incidents. So we just wanted to know the number of agencies, the number of times the perpetrator was arrested, uh, what the danger assessment score was for that person. Um, and again, whenever people started seeing this information, they were outraged and, and rightly so. How was our community failing survivors of domestic violence in this way? And so really all of that led up to getting the buy-in that we needed to open the center. So after that happened, after we were able to produce all this compelling data that was specific to our community, we had the buy-in, we had all of the people on board, all of the agencies were like, yes, we understand this, we believe in this, we have to come together. Um, and so we had to secure the funding. Uh, we were able to apply for our grant through the VOCA expansion. And so we secured the money in 2015 through the Louisiana Commission on Law Enforcement, which is the agency that uh, monitors and um, disperses VOCA money for our state. We received some additional support through uh, different local organizations and then Faith House, who's the lead agency, uh, basically kicked in the rest. So we had our grand opening ceremony on January the 22nd of 2016 and we opened for business on January the 25th of 2016. This is a picture of our grand opening ceremony, which you can see Mary Claire here. Mary Claire was instrumental in uh, providing us with technical assistance whenever we were opening the center and has been uh, since we've been opening open as well. Uh, so Faith House is the community based domestic violence crisis center and is the principal entity and lead agency for the Family Justice Center here. We have two staff members. Uh, that work for the center. We have our intake coordinator and a child advocate. So our intake coordinator is uh, greeting people who come to the center, doing our coordinated intake system, um, helping survivors with the navigation of on-site services. And then our child advocate provides the child care and also provides services um, for, to children affected by domestic violence. We um, have the following on-site partners. Uh, so we have law enforcement, prosecution, Hearts of Hope is our sexual assault response center. The supervised visitation center um, office is here. We don't actually have the actual visitation because we don't have perpetrators on site, but the office so victims can come in and sign up for that service um, is here at the center. We have the Canyon Legal Services and the Bar Association, which provides those attorney for civil legal services. We also have three offsite partners, the Clark Report, the Family Violence Intervention Program, which is our Batters Intervention Program, and then the Office on Probation and Parole. Um, Faith House provides the traditional domestic violence services um, that I believe that most community-based domestic violence service centers provide, so I'm not going to read all of them. We're also um, an address confidentiality program application assistance site, so we are able to do that. We, our advocates are also knowledgeable in the housing laws and housing protections for survivors of domestic violence, and we do a lot of assistance with that here. We also can do pictures and injury documentation for survivors. Um, the police department and the sheriff's office, of course, is following those reports and getting those updates. The sheriff's office also houses their uh, crime victims reparations and LAVINS, which is our automated victims no victim notification system. Um, that advocate that's in charge of those things is housed here at the Justice Center. Um, <clears throat> Hearts of Hope, which is the not sexual assault program can provide those services here to survivors as well. Um, and then the free attorney representation for protective orders and for some divorce and child custody matters.
In 2016, we served uh, 270 women, nine men, and 130 children. And the majority of the people coming into our center interacted with at least two partner agencies, and they reported four types of victimization. We get about a third of our referrals from Faith House, from people calling the crisis line and asking for assistance with domestic violence uh, help. And uh, we have about a quarter coming from other agencies and then the rest of them are coming from our criminal justice system. Our most requested services are civil legal assistance, advocacy, uh, assistance with filing reports with law enforcement, and then financial assistance and, or shelter are the things that survivors come in requesting the most. Uh, we d cannot meet the need of civil, civil legal services at this point in time, so we are working to build that up and, uh, and make that program a little bit larger. We also get a lot of requests for counseling, which we are not able to provide at this time. Um, there's a lack of shelter beds in our state um, and fi direct financial assistance to survivors and medical services. So this is kind of where we're going in the future and how we're going to build our program. Um, but I just wanted to include it to make sure everyone knew like these are mostly the things that survivors are asking for. Uh, we're a small center, so our total square feet is about 3,800 um, 3, square feet. We're located directly across the street from the courthouse, which has really been, um, really just been a great opportunity for us uh, to be able to interact with the court system. We're there so often. Walking across the street's really been a great benefit. So our common areas, we have a reception area, a waiting area, a children's room, a conference room, two interview rooms where we meet with survivors. All of our partners meet with survivors in those two interview rooms. Um, and then we have 11 offices. So this is our reception area, right? Whenever you walk into the building. This is just another view of it. This is our waiting area. We have a TV, uh, we keep a microwave, we keep food, coffee, drinks in that waiting area for survivors and their children to be able to, to use if they need to. Uh, this is one of our interview rooms. And this is our second interview room. And this interview room, if you see this camera up here in the corner, uh, this interview room has the ability to record so this is open to all the law enforcement agencies in our parish where they can come in and conduct victim interviews in this room uh, versus having victims go to the, the station and doing those interviews there. We also have a camera and a, a photo printer so that we can take pictures of injuries and have that all printed out here at the center. This is our conference room and our children's room. Um, in addition, we have a few initiatives that we run here at the center. We have a high risk response team. We meet twice a month where we're doing case review on people that score within the extreme danger category of the danger assessment. Um, and then we have all of our agencies that have agreed to provide some sort of enhanced response to these cases. So all of the agencies are notified that this is a high risk case and uh, they're paying extra attention to these cases and making sure that the ball isn't getting dropped anywhere along the way. We still do conduct fatality reviews. It's not a standing work group. We just do it as we get three or four cases where we're able to review them. We do that and then we utilize that information moving forward uh, whenever we're sharing data about domestic violence in our community. And about our affiliation decision, we really wanted to affiliate because we wanted to stay connected on a national level to other centers. Uh, we wanted to stay committed to best practices, and so we wanted the resources and the knowledge from the Alliance, uh, and we wanted to be able to utilize that in a, in a great way to make our center better. 
And then the last one is just validation, and particularly because we're such a small center from a small community, um, it's difficult, you know, for us to be able to compete with the huge um, programs that are so great and doing all of these wonderful things. So we wanted something that would say, yes, oh, uh, you know, you are doing the right thing or trying to do the right thing for survivors. Um, and something that would just make us stand out a little bit among the competition. So thank you uh, for learning a little bit more about our center. And I would definitely be open to people contacting me if you have additional questions about our center and how we opened. Thank you. Thank you so much, Crystal. That was great. I love the photos of your center, the rooms, everything looked so warm and felt really welcoming and comfortable. So congratulations. Um, to you for that, that they look, that they look gorgeous. Um, one, one question I have that I like to ask is what, in your opinion, makes your center unique? I know your center is small, but aside from that, what do you think makes your center unique? Well, I feel like we've really fostered a sense of family here at our center. And so um, all of our partners and all of our agencies, have, they really have just bought into to, this idea and we've really worked together well um, and even though we've been open um, almost two years now we've really seen some significant impact into the way that our community is responding to domestic violence so i think that um, one of the things that makes us unique i'm assuming i don't know is that we were able to integrate very quickly Oh, that makes sense. That's great. And I really like the fact that you are across the street from the courthouse, so it makes it a lot easier for clients, especially when they've just received maybe a bad a bad ruling in court, something that they're frustrated with. They can come, go across the street and talk to somebody to help them process it. Um, I love. I like where your location is. That's, that's great. Um, what is one piece of advice that you would want to share with developing centers? The one piece of advice I'd want to share is probably just not to give up. Even whenever things look like they're not going to work out, whenever you get discouraged or you get bad news from an agency that you're trying to get on, on board, don't give up and just keep going. Keep the survivors in mind um, and be persistent. I like that. That's, that's great. I like that word, be persistent. Be persistent. Well, thank you, Crystal, so much for um, doing this recording with us. And thank you, those who were watching and listening. And we hope that this information has um, helped you move forward in the planning processes for your centers or even giving you ideas of different programming for those centers who are open. So thanks so much. Bye.